everyone and welcome to our presentation. Today, me, Marta, and Dalek are going to introduce to you our project, which is a pick and place vehicle. Before diving deeper into it, we would like to present you a quick demonstration of how it works. Okay, so that concludes the demonstration. Let's now uh, dig behind uh, what happened during this one academic year. The table of content for our today's presentation is going to be, we're going to introduce you the motivation behind this project. We're going to walk you through the process of what we did throughout this. Uh, we are going to quickly demonstrate you the working principle on our project. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the applications it has, uh, and we're going to tell you how we envision the future works on it, and we're going to conclude. So, um, as many of you might know, robotic arms are heavily used in industries during manufacturing processes, and they are there uh, mainly to assist humans in mundane and dangerous tasks. So, when uh, researching, uh, we thought about what if we take a robotic arm and actually mount it on something to make it mobile, to use it in the different areas. Uh, other points of motivation that also inspired us is that the specialization of both of us, uh, we are both interested in electronics engineering and we want to professionally pursue this career. So we thought that this project would be a great opportunity for us to uh, learn a lot about it. Uh, also, this kind of a system is not uh, widely available for audience for research purposes and uh, we thought that a lot of students would have benefited from this if they had it during their studies. And finally, this past four years in the AUA, we had a multidisciplinary course. It was composed of studies from mechanical engineering, electronics, software, and we thought that it would make sense if our project was also a multidisciplinary one. So uh, the three main components of our project is the vehicle, which is for the mobility. It is the robotic arm, uh, which has the grabbing mechanism, and we have a gesture control mechanism, which is a glove. Um, this is our system design. Uh, so we uh, have separated the vehicle with robotic arm and the gesture control separately. For the vehicle and robotic arm, we have two DC motors and six servo motors. Um, we also have the Arduino nano board with the LED communication. We have the motor driver and uh, we have a video camera system here. Uh, for the gesture control, there is no actuating part here. There is only sensing. We have five flex sensors here, a battery, Arduino board, um, and also separately we have a screen for uh, the user to have a vision of what is happening in front of our device. Uh, let's now uh, walk you through the process of what we did. Uh, we have separated it into uh, three parts. We're going to talk about mechanical design, then we're going to switch uh, about the electrical circuit, and then the software programming behind this. 
Uh, let's start with the mechanical design of the robotic arm as we started with it as well. So um, these are the larger parts. They were designed using the SolidWorks software. Uh, holes visible here are uh, for the servos that will be mounted on them later on. Uh, the dimensions of those uh, were taken into account. This is the second part uh, with smaller parts mainly here introduced. Uh, so the smaller parts were for the grabbing mechanism and the larger parts you can see starting from the base. Uh, so the larger parts uh, were printed with 50% infill. Uh, there were a few reasons for that. First of all, we wanted them to be lightweight, uh, not to overload our motors and vehicle. And also for fi financial reasons, because the uh, less the infill, the less costly it would have been. And for the smaller parts, we had 100% infill uh, because it was responsible for the grabbing mechanism. And in terms of finances, the change wouldn't be that much significant. Next is the mechanical design of our vehicle. Again. Um, most of the parts were 3D printed here, uh, except all of this plate. Um, the plate here is not really visible because it is covered, uh, but uh, it is a four millimeters thick acrylic glass, which was cut using a laser cutter machine. Uh, the material was based, uh, the choice of the material was based on a few criteria. It needed to be strong enough to endure the weight that we were to mount on it, but it also needed to be lightweight enough because, again, we didn't want to increase the overall weight which was going to be on our motors. And finally, we opted for a material that would be cheap and available for us. Uh, here you can see our first prototype because the delivery of the parts was a bit delayed not to lose time on the logistics we decided to build this kind of small vehicle to test some software to test the communication uh, and uh, this is the first prototype uh, this is our design alternative this is the first design of the vehicle it's more or less the same the only thing different are the dc motors we had a problem with those because they weren't providing enough torque so when the vehicle was just set on the table it wasn't able to move it was because of the absence of the gearbox. And the second problem with those motors, it was the coupling between the motor and the wheel. It was not uh, call-centric, and it, it resulted in vibrations. That's why we decided to go for the uh, older motors, which we can see here, the yellow mm -hmm. ones, and in the design. And uh, it already had integrated gearbox, and the coupling was done much easier. And you can see here, with the, uh, without the cover and with the cover design, in the video you also saw without the, this cover, we did it so you can see the electronics inside, but for aesthetics we have the cover here. Now let's go a bit into the electrical design. On the left you can see the power tree of the robotic arm in the vehicle. It's powered using three lithium-ion batteries connected in series, which are resulting in around 12 volts. Uh, those batteries are powering directly the Arduino nano board, which because it has a wide uh, range of input, that's why we don't need any converters. It supplies the DC motor drivers and a DC-DC converter, which steps down voltage from 12 to 5 volts to supply the servo motors and the video transmission system. On the right, you can see our circuit. We have six servos connected directly to the Arduino. We have six pins which are going to the motor driver. Four of them are digital pins used for the direction control, and two of them are analog for the speed control of each motor. For the motor driver, we have the supply and uh, outputs for two DC motors. Now, the, uh, in terms of software, when the program starts, it moves all the servos in some predefined zero position, which you have seen in the video. It initializes the BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy Module, and it starts to search for the central device, which in our case is the gesture control glove. When it receives data from the uh, gesture control glove, it starts to uh, read the data and understand in which mode it currently is. When it's off, it just does nothing, it stays as it is. When it's a vehicle mode, it controls the motors, the speed and direction with the motor driver. And with an, in the R mode, it controls the servos. We had a slight problem with that because Arduino documentation provides only five PWM pins, pulse with modulated pins, which are required for servo control. But we used two of them for speed control and we're left with three. But we needed six of them for servos. So we tried to uh, do, uh, implement a software solution, generate PWM manually using timer interrupts, which we succeeded in, but the problem was the timing wasn't perfect. There was, there was some noise in the servos, and then we decided to research what is the actual PWM frequency that Arduino is generating, and we found out that this Arduino board can generate PWM on every GPIO pin. That's how we just connected to six uh, pins next to each other, and it worked pretty well. Uh, from gesture control, uh, this is our gesture control device. Here you can see again Arduino, same board, five flex sensors for each uh, finger, power on switch, battery, mode button to change the modes, uh, onboard RGB LED, and the battery. Uh, 
what the uh, design opportunities we had here, firstly, first like major issue we had that we didn't know how to attach flex sensors to the glove. We thought about gluing, but we thought that it might damage the sensor, that's why we didn't proceed with it. We tried knitting the sensors to the glove, but it didn't work well because sensors were slipping out of their places. And, and in, uh, finally, we used double-sided tape, which worked pretty well, as you can see on the actual design. And the second question we had is whether we should put flex sensors on the inside of the pole or on the outside. In this picture, it's on the inside, it was our first test, but it didn't work well because these are flex sensors, they are not bent sensors, and when it's on the inside and you bend your finger, the uh, sensors are not giving consistent value, so you can't understand whether it's flex or not. That's why we changed the design to have it on the outside, and it worked well. Um, from circuit point of view, power tree is pretty simple, it's just 9-volt battery connected directly to the Arduino. Uh, in the circuit, we have five flex sensors with their signal conditioning. We use voltage divider to supply the voltage to the Arduino and read the resistance change in the flex sensors. Uh, we have a power input and we have a button with a pull-up resistor to read the mode change. From software point of view, algorithmically, it's a bit more complicated, but the block diagram is simple because we have initializing, we're initializing the IMU model, inertial measurement unit, the BLE model, and we're connected to the peripheral device, which is the vehicle in this case. Uh, when we're reading the button from the mode, we had a problem that uh, we had we had to deal with button debouncing. We did it uh, software-wise, so that each press of a button is detected as one press and not multiple, which is a common problem with uh, chip buttons. Uh, when it's re it reads the mode, in the off mode, it sends an empty buffer to the vehicle, so the vehicle knows that it has nothing to do. In the vehicle mode, it parses the IMU data, the roll and pitch angles and it then sends the, uh, the vehicle the control buffer. In the R mode, it parses both IMU and flex sensors data and sends the con appropriate control buffer to the vehicle. Okay, so now that you have been introduced with the work we have done, let's have a small demonstration of how it works. So I'm turning on the vehicle in the gesture control globe. So, um, if I have my red button displayed, it means that I cannot control nor the vehicle nor the robotic arm. Uh, I'm switching one time and now I'm controlling the uh, robotic arm. And uh, yeah, okay, let's see how it works. So it uh, uses the uh, data from the IMU and flex sensors. Uh, so the bending of index finger controls uh, the bottom server, which you cannot see, and this one. and tilting it right, right to left controls the bottom servo, which is not seen right here. Uh, now if I am uh, bending my middle finger, it controls uh, the next two servos. Again, the movements are same. Uh, we thought about designing them as intuitive as possibly. Uh, these, the ring finger controls only one servo, which is right here. It only has these two directions no directions uh, for the right and left. And the pinky finger is responsible for the grabbing mechanism. Again, it only has the upward and downward direction without doing it for the right and left. Now, uh, if I switch to the next mode, which is the green and the vehicle, so uh, the robotic arm remains in the position it was left before switching. So uh, we have placed this on something so that you can see how the motors are rotating uh, to the forward, the backward direction, and tilting them right and left results in clockwise and counterclockwise direction. Let's talk about a few applications. Firstly, it can be used in the military. In the battlefield, you don't want soldiers running around the battlefield. That, so you might have this kind of small vehicle which can transport some objects from point A to point B. On the top right, you can see a small ball which is <coughs> when thrown in the fire, it can quickly extinguish it. This kind of small vehicle can carry a few of them and place it in the burning house and it can open the route for the fireman to go inside the house, which is a problem sometimes. Uh, it can be used in the hospital. It can travel, uh, mm, transport some uh, medicine or some papers from one room to another without any human interaction. And it can be used to help handicapped people and maybe increase their life quality. Uh, when we also talk about the future works and uh, where this project can be used in our uh, university, so for the rising seniors and other students in engineering sciences, this can uh, serve for them as a base and they can make an improvements and uh, automate some processes and present it as their capstone. Uh, a few things that we thought of, uh, it could be done by health planning for the robotic arm and for the vehicle, differential drive vehicle control can be applied here as a project. 
Uh, also, uh, this can be a good <coughs> for demonstration purposes during different classes uh, we are studying. Uh, some of the options that we followed are the CAD circuits, mechatronics, design systems, engineering, and much more, as these courses cover some of the concepts uh, that we have applied here. Um, a few learning outcomes. Uh, this surely was a journey for us, and we have learned a lot uh, throughout it. I want to talk about the 3D design and printing first. Uh, so we already had some kind of experience from our previous course, uh, but we learned a lot of new features and tools, and we did our research on different filaments and fields, and they dig into the process of the 3D printing. Uh, we also improved our software knowledge, as we learned a lot about parsing, the EMU data, data um, button debouncing, uh, reading sensor data, and uh, also configuring VL communication. Uh, we also improved our soldiering skills and, uh, well, tried our best not to burn down anything in the process. We didn't. Um, we also learned a lot about different types of motors there are. Uh, we learned about their capabilities and limitations, uh, as well as we used flex sensors and they were also studied and signal conditioning was applied. Uh, also, different types of Arduino boards uh, were studied to decide which board we actually want to choose, and uh, a lot of research was done on our microcontroller. Also, uh, this video right here that you can see is the, our initial test vehicle. We also uh, automated it uh, so that it can drive without our uh, uh, without the gesture control mechanism. It drives uh, with its sensors. Uh, finally, I want to say uh, that this project wouldn't have become a reality if it wasn't for the support of our supervisors, our dearest professors, and the whole College of Science and Engineering, which showed us its utmost support and uh, gave us the motivation to pursue this idea. Uh, I want also to give a special thank you to Professor Mihnan Gurunyan, who was our supervisor, to Dr. Rubina Danilova, uh, Dr. Hrecha Kocharyan, and Dr. Bilor Gurunyan for their contribution to this project. And we also want to thank you for your attention. Um, we are ready for your questions. Uh, could you please tell how, or if you had any testing procedures, like uh, how you achieved the performance that you were showing? I'm sure there were many failures before you have it working the way it is working now what kind of strategy you were following and how you have tested what phases have you passed. Okay, I think I can start and then we'll continue. So, uh, I, want, I want to mention about the robotic arm. Uh, some of the parameters that we had uh, is uh, the maximum weight that it can endure, which was uh, about 200 grams. We did uh, this kind of manual testing when we uh, picked an object and gradually increased their weight uh, until uh, we figured out that at some point, which was in between 250 to 350 grams, uh, that um, it is having a hard time, like the motor uh, was pulling it upwards, but it was doing it extremely hard. Uh, and uh, actually, we um, bring down one of the servos because of it. At first, we didn't figure it out because it didn't uh, stop working right afterwards. But it was it. This was one of the testings that we applied. Excuse me. Uh, can yeah. I additionally ask, like, what do you think? Why the motor burn? Like, wh why it stopped working um, because of the weight? But like, what happens inside? Electronically, uh, can you explain, like? Uh, I can try. Uh, so the um, the free servos that you can see right here are actually different from this ones. Uh, they are much <laughs> smaller, and uh, they're. Uh, I, I'm guessing that their applications are limited, and uh, they're just not uh, made for that, that much of bearing that much weight. More uh, electronically, like for example, is it because of current voltage or what's happening? I think the reason is that we have gears rotating each other, so we have, we're applying small voltage, but it gives a very high force for the gears. So when we're trying to uh, grab a heavy object, the gears are like mismatching from their positions. That's why it's, uh, it's not able to then detect, because there is a sensor in the server that detects its position, it's a feedback, so it, it's not able to track its position. It's not related to that, it's just increasing the current, and that's why it burns the motor, because the current is increasing because of the load. Anyway, okay, thank you. Uh, should we continue about the testing part, or? Yeah, the you can. 
go ahead. Okay. Uh, from software point of view, we can say that at first we test it on the uh, test vehicle, and like each module was tested separately. We can ha we have separate files for maybe mod DC motors testing, separate for servos, separate for BLE connectivity. So tested each module separately, to try to integrate them into one project and test everything together. What is that separate testing called? Component, Compo component testing, component testing, and then integration <laughs> testing. Okay. In the software world, it's more unit testing rather yeah. than component testing. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, it's more, first, it's like more technical. So I've seen you using these uh, flex sensors. I guess they're working as an analog, right? Yes. So if, if you're bending, it changes the resistance. Um, I was hoping to see that you could use that resistance change in the control rather than using as a switch. So I've noticed that you're using as a switch. Have you tried to use these that as a control and what yes. why did you stood back from that idea? Uh, the main problem with this was imagine like one of the fingers controls this servos. For example, this servo. For you, when you bend your finger, it moves. Yes. That's what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then when you switch to the vehicle mode, you need to remember in which position your finger was. So if you then uh, you move your finger a little bit and you switch to the R mode, the servos will start rotating randomly in the current positions. That's why we uh, opted for direction control, in, uh, the direction control instead of the position control, so that the user won't remember its older positions. Well, uh, I mean, if you would use your, so you're using IMU on your hand side, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like if you're you're rotating your hand, that can be something that is moving the vehicle, and if you're moving your fingers, that can, you know, use the arm, for example. Uh, that it kind of models, have you experimented with those? Oh, it can, but even in this position, when you're trying only to control two servos with one IMU, so if one uh, roll controls one direction, pitch controls the other, sometimes when you're doing pitch, you're doing a little bit of roll because you, you don't have like any feedback how much you turn in each direction. So it's a bit complicated for a person to track everything, and especially when one of your finger is bent, your hand goes up a little bit, so you're bending your finger and it gives some uh, pitch angle, which is a bit complicated, so we try to like uh, make it as simple as possible and yeah, use it as a switch rather than analog. Did you consider two gloves? So that it's like decoupling a little bit of this yeah, like, uh, thought. incredible dexterous <laughs> manipulation? Yeah, we, we actually <laughs> thought about doing it. Uh, but at the end of the day, as also mentioned in our capstone report, we wanted it to make in a way that if we introduce this to someone who has no technical background, it will take us like five to 10 minutes for them to actually use mm -hmm. this because we also wanted to use it in real life. But yes, we had that in mind. We just opted for a simpler mm -hmm. version and also because of the lack of time. And wiring will also be more complicated. Imagine like there's wire going from one hand to another. You're limited in your motion. So. Mm. And my second question yeah. is if you would have more resources like time and uh, money and expertise, what would you change in your project? Mm. Are there any things that you were planning to do but because of lack of resources you gave it up mm, one thing that I want to mention is that now as you can see uh, we are switching from robotic arm mode to the vehicle mode which means that when you're actually driving you cannot pick anything and uh, we thought it's okay to have as a case uh, but uh, sometimes you're grabbing something on the go and what if we had more time uh, would consider uh, doing it in the way that they can work simultaneously it's one thing from me. Also, we can use automation. We can maybe place a GPS model there and uh, give points where it go from point A to point B and grab object from this coordinate. That's automation is another place. Maybe we can, we showed four applications, but this one is like proof of concept. So we could have built a real vehicle for one of those applications, not just a general vehicle that proves that this is possible and what we can do, what we did. And the final thing, we have a Bluetooth connection and uh, it is working like up to 10 to 15 meters, so that is also a limiting condition. I think we'll work on uh, something to expand the range of motion of this. Okay, thank you. A couple of questions for me. Okay. Please answer the first yeah. one, why Bluetooth versus Wi-Fi? And also have you prepared the user manual? Uh, uh, well, it, it, it kind of includes the how it's controlled. So yeah, it's not like uh, intuitive for user, like you do this and it happens this, but um, it's more or less the, the same concept. And why Bluetooth versus Wi-Fi? Because we had this board available here, so we won't waste some time or wait for all other boards to arrive. Maybe Wi-Fi would consume more power? 
maybe. <laughs> but I, I don't think we have power consumption problem here because we have like batteries are running for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.